good afternoon everyone welcome to today's seminar on wireless at virginia tech's cognitive radio test bits i am devin chheda and uh, in the first part of today's talk we'll be talking about the test bits the hardware components of it uh, me and raghu would be doing that and uh, next we would have eric presenting the software side of things this is a brief outline of today's talk uh, i introduce the cognitive radio network test bits and uh, we talk about the lte cornet test bit so the original cornet design consists of 48 uh, software defined radio nodes which are located along the hallways of uh, kelly hall so there are four floors and 12 nodes on each of the hallways and uh, the beauty of the system is it's completely free and it's remotely accessible and uh, any user who has registered can access the system and uh, each node has a usrp and a dedicated server attached with it and this system was established back in 2008 the next addition to the cornet family was the outdoor cornet system which is uh, which consists of more than 10 sdr nodes and uh, each sdr node is mounted on the rooftop of several of college buildings and uh, you can take a look at the map over here you can see there are about 15 uh, 15 nodes that are shown this is the location of the original cornet system in kelly hall and uh, we have all the nodes marked in green and uh, we will later talk of the lt cornet test bed which is located in dara so now each node here consists of an sdr it consists of a workstation it consists of a gps uh, source to ensure uh, synchronization of all the sdrs and uh, again it is free and uh, remotely accessible next this is the lte cornet testbed is the latest addition to the cornet testbed families it's a unique university level sdr based testbed which enables lt research and education so this is this is the main this is the heart of the system and uh, i'll briefly point out the major components that you can see uh, we have three software defined radios over here Al alongside this diagram you have the phantom diagram so you can match components and read off the names and uh, we have a network emulator called rfness we have measurement equipment we have a shielded enclosure and we have four dedicated workstations which handle this system and uh, this lt cornet test bed operates in two basic modes one is the cabled mode where the channel is emulated and the second is the actual radiated or over the air mode so we'll take a look at the emulated channel mode first so as you can see i have four usrps over here and uh, i have my rf nest hardware on the right and uh, the rf nest is an eight port stand alone device which can independently manage the attenuation and channel effects on each of those paths so you can define a path from say port 1 to port 5 and you can independently change its characteristics and uh, <coughs> the switching between the two modes is taken care of by the rf switch and this is the rf switch shown below this is this is my rf switch it allows me to choose the path to the rf nest hardware or to the antennas next is the radiated mode where there is actually transmission happening over the air and uh, in this case if you compare this diagram with the previous diagram you have the usrps and the rf switch but now instead of having an rf nest hardware over here you have rf filters to prevent spurious modes from being transmitted and they are connected to antennas and these antennas we have five five of such omnidirectional antennas so in the bottom right you see an ceiling mounted antenna so i'm having trouble with the mouse pointer sorry for that so these antennas there are five antennas mounted in the rf lab which is adjoining the server room and uh, they are cabled through the wall between the server room and the antenna lab so these five 
antennas can be used independently like you can have one USRP acting as the UE attached to one of the antennas you can have one USRP acting as the base station and attached to another and you can have say uh, an interferer in one of the antennas and it allows us to bring in our own UEs say I, I want to bring in and test with my own smartphone I can go to that lab use, use that with the uh, antennas and uh, connect to my system and uh, so we looked at the two modes of operation of the system and uh, I'll briefly walk you through the different components of the system the first is the E node B which is the base station in the LTE system so we have three options of creating one the first is by using a CMW 500 standalone LTE system which is an industry-wide wideband LTE system which is capable of uh, generating LTE signaling and uh, also doing UE testing. We also have a professional grade uh, software radio based LTE system called Amerisoft LTE system and uh, as you can see in the screenshot it's a command line driven it has a command line driven interface and uh, it supports both TDD and FDD modes of operation and uh, it allows rapid deployment of multiple cells and multiple UEs to connect to each of those cells. And uh, recently we have also added some open source LTE libraries to our system. So one of them is SRS LTE or Software Radio Solutions LTE. It is developed by Trinity College of Dublin that is the TCD. And uh, there's also a package that we have recently, uh, we are using that, it's called Open Air Interface. It's developed by Eurocom Corporation of France. Uh, next, we have a broad range of user equipments which we can use with the system. So you, as you can see, they are in different form factors. We have them in USB dongles, then we have them in the router form where you can cable it up with the setup. And lastly, we have uh, access to the latest tablets and smartphones. And uh, the CPE over here stands for uh, Consumer Premises Equipment. So that is just another name for UE. And lastly, uh, we walk through the modes of operation, all the different components of the system. And this slide essentially tries to summarize how the entire system communicates with each other. So you can identify the basic blocks in the system. You have the measurement equipment on the top left. You have the USRPs attached to three computers. You have RF switches and they all interface with the network switch. And uh, on the other side, you have a gateway computer which is connected to the switch and the gateway computer is also connected to the internet. So the way it works is if a user wants to access the test bed, he, access, he requests access from the administrators. You, we generate a certificate for usage of the test bed and using a VPN network, you access the gateway computer over the internet and uh, using that, then you can access the devices. Like once you are on the network, you can access and bring up windows for each device and operate the test bed remotely. So that is what we are planning to do next. And uh, Raghu would be giving you a short demonstration of the capabilities that I just presented. Thank you. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Raghu, and uh, uh, today I'll be giving you a short. Uh, demonstration about the capabilities of the test uh, bed that we are uh, setting up. So uh, I'll just walk you through uh, how would how it would actually feel if a user were to access the test bed from his or her computer at home. So the setup is very simple. So we have uh, Amarisoft uh, LT100 system. It has uh, the mobility management entity and the E-Node B modules. Uh, and the E-Node B module is interface to the USRP which generates um, LT signals. It can generate both TDD and FDD like Devin mentioned. And um, it is cabled um, into the RFNES channel emulator. Um, it 
So uh, with the RFNest channel emulator, you can change various parameters of the channel, like um, for example, attenuation or delay, things like that. And then uh, the output of the RFNest channel emulator, we um, connect it to the UE and uh, uh, we show the spectrum, uh, the LTE downlink spectrum. Uh, so with that, I'll open up. So uh, for remote login, we are using a client called as OpenVPN. Uh, there are two or three of them that we are actually using, but uh, OpenVPN is the one that you need to install on your computer if you were to access it from outside. So right here, um, this is the graphic user interface of the RFU. So it's the GUI for uh, RFNIST, the hardware that I mentioned about a couple of uh, in the previous slide. So with this, you can set each path um, the attenuation between each path so that you can simulate any um, scenario that you would like to test. So in this case, um, we have connected the CMW500 as a spectrum analyzer. So um, the CMW500 is connected as a spectrum analyzer and we would be um, viewing the OFDM spectrum. Um, so for that, the CMW500 is connected to one of the servers, um, in this case, PC1. So I'm actually accessing PC1. Um, so if you see here, you there is no signal. You, it's just a noise floor. Um, uh, this is the dashboard of the um, CMW500 spectrum analyzer. Uh, the interesting thing about CMW500 is it, it can operate in two modes. So this is the general purpose RF spectrum analyzer. But it also has a, um, it, it can also operate as a LTE base station. So it can generate um, both TDD and FDD LTE signals. And you can monitor parameters in real time, like uh, the, the um, status of a cell, whether it's connected to a cell or not, and its reference signal power, uh, the channel quality indicator, um, and um, throughput, block error rate, a, a lot of interesting things. So basically you would um, look at the uplink of the LTE signal like uh, an operator would uh, look like, would view it. So with that, uh, we'll get back to the PC1. So in PC1, we are generating uh, LT signals through Amari soft. So this is a SDR based uh, E node B. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run a simple script that initializes Amari soft. So you can see it's um, band seven, um, center frequency is 2680 megahertz with a bandwidth of 10 megahertz. So um, transmit and receive gain can also be configured in real time. And uh, with that, the spectrum. So, so this is the real-time OFDM spectrum that you can see, and uh, some of it goes up and down. So those are the controls channel um, transmitted in the downlink. So now, for example, you can do a um, number of things. Um, like for example, you can change the channel attenuation and uh, see what would happen. So. In this case, you could actually set it to a very high attenuation, like minus 100 dB or something, and there you go. No, no FDM signal. So this, and just a feel as to how uh, a, a user could monitor different instruments from his or her, her laptop. Um, outside the campus. So the intention is to provide this free of cost to researchers who would, who would like to test their systems. Uh, and uh, there, there are a couple of different uh, things that we could do, but unfortunately you can't actually see it because um, you could actually connect a UE and show, um, um, you can stream a video for example, or even um, do interference measurements. So how 
um, a jammer on a pilot symbol would affect the blocker rate performance, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of things that we can do, but this was a pretty simple demonstration of what um, how the user could control the system from the comfort of from the comfort of his or her home. So um, with that, so, uh, one last thing we could just quit it and say, see the spectrum again. So yeah, done again. Oh, I thought it didn't. Yes, it was set at 100. All right, so uh, I'd be happy to answer answer any questions you guys would have. Thank you. Yeah, if you have any questions for these guys, go ahead. I'll give you the microphone though. Okay, I got it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, first off is when you talk about UE usage included in the test facility and maybe Is there any restrictions on which bands that you talked about bringing your own users? So there's going to be FCC restrictions and things like that, experimental licensing and things like that. And I know you have some, but I don't know. Is that did that band in the beginning? Was that the list of FCC experimental yes. licenses that you had? Is that the pairings that you had? Is that what that was? Is that like you know B and U pairings, or was that just all the different bands that you configured in your user? So the list that it was in the beginning of the project. Yes, so that was the list of bands for which we have the experimental license. Okay. And uh, it's different from the one that we'll be using for the indoor one. Right, okay. Yeah, I thought that was the Cornet facility, so not necessary the LTP Cornet facility. So. Yes, so this is, this is, we'll be using some of these bands. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, well, then it's okay. So if you bring your own UE and stuff, you're going to be having limitations. You need to know what it is. Uh, second thing is back on the uh, on the demo. Just considering the time constraint is really nice. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can you can you can you develop can can the interface support like running a? I would imagine since this is a free facility for people to use for research and stuff during the yes. school work and stuff. Yes. That scheduling might become an issue, and as a result of that, you might want to be able to develop and run test scripts and be able to record the measurement results, like from the CMW five hundred or whatever. Are those capabilities included? Yes. Okay. So there would be a configuration file. Uh, I'm talking about Amari Soft. I'm not exactly sure about um, CMW 500. But in Amari Soft, you would have to go uh, to the configuration file yourself and figure out what parameters need to be tweaked to change the scheduling parameters. Okay. Yeah. okay, so basically go look at the data sheets on the Amari Soft stuff and the CMW 500 or whatever that capacity is. Yes. Something that maybe could be added yes. for FAC or something. Okay, cool. Um, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I couldn't read my own handwriting because it was right from that. Can you, can you implement walking and and vehicle motion models, there are standards in the LTP um, test standards for that. Can you, can you even, that's, I guess it's a, that's another test script or input thing with that, your, uh, your, your open, what is it, open VPN um, stuff that you were using. Can you implement motion and things like that and like that? Okay, good. Yes. Right. So uh, the way it would be done is, uh, uh, do you remember the screen that we had for yes. the review? So that was basically a scenario. Right. And you can define and actually place your uh, radios on the map. And you can define basic motion and trajectories on, onto it. Cool. So once you do that, RFNest would then automatically calculate the attenuation and it would do that. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, no, in this case it was all cabled. It was all cabled. No, it. No, this was band seven, 2680 megahertz. Right, but then you're not transmitting anything. No, no, no. 
Not over the, there. The not configuration over. was like this. The signals right. were passing through the RF nest and the channel effects were introduced by the RF nest. Right. So I think I could basically bring any unit, irrespective of whether we have a live unit. For that, we also showed a capability in the lab where you brought your own UE and you actually radiated over the air. This that one. was my specific question. Right. That I just wanted to clarify the question. Yeah, no, that's a good point. You're right. As long as you can get to the antenna on your own UE somehow and contain the emissions, you can do exactly what you're saying. And uh, my second question is, is you had a, a lot of different UEs. Do all the UEs connect via the same uh, mode, like a USB, or how, how it connects? So uh, Rogers is a dongle, so USB. The, 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 in the left, everything can be accessed through USB. And um, Huawei, you need an Ethernet cable. And uh, phone mits everything over here. Actually, the Huawei, oh, uh, the phones and the tablets are over here. Oh, okay. Mm. Oh, okay. Even, even the Huawei router, you can have a connection through a cable. You, you can have an RF cable running up to the device, or you could also use the built-in antenna or maybe connect your own antenna to the device. Right, but uh, coming back to my previous point, then if I bring my own UE, mm -hmm. I cannot wire it. I cannot use uh, connect it using the RF cable. Uh, well, that would again depend on what kind of UE you are bringing. In. Exactly. If you are bringing in a UE of say this type, the one in the middle, right. yes, it can be cabled in. Some of the Keep some of the devices on the left, the one with the USB dongle, they also have miniature ports using which you can have SMA connectors and you can connect a cable. Right. No, I meant a UV like this. Uh, yes. You yes. Could. We cannot cable it, right? You cannot cable it, no. Okay. No. No. I got your question now. <laughs> yeah, 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 we have time for maybe one or two more quick questions. Anybody? Uh, what are the things that can be like tested in the uh, this test bit? Like, uh, uh, will there be physical layer things like synchronization and stuff or uh, scheduling like MAC versus the CPU? Um, with Amari Soft, um, you, uh, uh, there are some things you can control and some things you cannot. For example, the basic LT structure you cannot control. It's closed, so you can't change the code. But uh, when it comes to things like SRS, LT, or open air interface, you can tweak it to uh, uh, change the stages like synchronization or channel estimation, things like that. Um, so from my knowledge, Amari software implements the entire stack from five till, I think, probably network layer. Up till network layer, it emulates it. Uh, SRS, LT has still the Mac layer. I'm not sure about open air interface. Uh, CMW 500, again, it implements the entire stack of the LTE system. Can you talk about your own uh, So, yeah, for example, what I was, uh, I mean, uh, what I was trying to do was I was trying to force handovers from one cell to another uh, manually, I mean, without, without the need of any channel measurements, whether it was actually possible or not, things like that. And gradually lowering the power, uh, doing some power control, to gradually move on to another cell and things like that. Just some some scenarios that you can test. Okay. okay. With that, uh, we thank our couple speakers here. We'll then switch over to Eric. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, our next speaker is Eric. Um, he's also I'll step on the side. He's a master's of science student here at Virginia Tech. Uh, his advisor is uh, Dr. Uh, Bureau. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he also you also do your undergrad here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, some research interests are uh, software-defined radio, cognitive radio, and uh, 
interactive, re interactive receivers uh, for multiple user MIMO. With that, Eric. Is iter iterative receivers. Oops. <laughs> okay. That's all right. My eyes are going out. Yeah. Um, yeah hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a project uh, that we've been working on here uh, for maybe a, a year now or so. Um, and it's a, it's a software framework to enable uh, test and evaluation of cognitive radio networks. Um, so in this presentation, I'll briefly go through the background, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, uh, talk about the specific problem we're trying to address and our goals and the architecture of our solution. I'll show some initial results and conclude. Oh yeah, so the basic background is, you know, as demand for wireless data and services is exponentially increasing, um, the value of spectrum and its scarcity is, is likewise increasing. Um, and so an attractive you know, technology and uh, option that people have been looking into for years now um, is cognitive radio and spectrum sharing. Um, and this is due to the fact that although the, all the spectrum is licensed out, um, it's not necessarily utilized as efficiently as it could be when you look at it in terms of frequency, time, and space. Um, and so, of course, the, the more efficiently these cognitive radios are able to use the spectrum, the more value they bring. Um, and there's, there's some interesting things that happen when you look at networks of these cognitive radios and how they interact with one another and um, how the overall behavior plays out. Um, so the problem we're trying to address is that uh, a lot of the the R&D and testing of cognitive radios is done in a very ad hoc manner, and it's kind of just you know for a specific product or looking at a very specific problem. Um, and there, there, there aren't, there isn't really a general kind of framework to um, enable rapid uh, test and evaluation of cognitive radios. Um, and of course, cognitive radio test beds and software-defined radio frameworks, th those all exist. Um, you know, talking about Cornet, LTE Cornet. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with like GNU Radio, that's the, probably the most well-known software-defined radio framework. Um, but again, yeah, not a, not a framework for, you know, um, rapid cognitive radio network experimentation. Um, and there's been some theoretical work on different uh, test and evaluation methodologies, um, but a lot of them haven't actually been really done or implemented in practice. Um, so, so kind of the goal of what we're trying to do then is, is build an open source modular framework for test and evaluation of cognitive and spectrum sharing radios. Um, one of the key, yeah, kind of design spaces when we've been going through this is um, the trade-off between flexibility and uh, kind of giving the user a structure that's, uh, that enables them to work, you know, very quickly and efficiently. Um, and then finally, of course, once the framework has been developed enough, we'd like to actually use it to conduct research. Um, yeah, one, one uh, area of research that uh, a student, Freddie Romano, I don't know if he's here, um, but he, he's looking into this as um, psychometric methods and item response theory, um, which is a, a test methodology for cognitive radios. And it's, it's derived from, um, so item response theory is, relates to human testing, and the idea is that um, you can actually adapt your test based on the responses of the human. So, for instance, if you're trying to evaluate, you know, how good someone is at math, you know, you start asking questions kind of towards the middle of the range in terms of difficulty, and as they respond, you can kind of converge to their skill sets and, and more quickly uh, and firmly kind of figure out what their ability is. So, so the idea is, you know, we can apply that same idea to the test and evaluation of cognitive radios. Um, so, so yeah, I guess the, yeah, I guess I didn't mention the name. So we're, we're calling this framework the Cognitive Radio Test System, or CRTS. And this is kind of a high-level diagram of what CRTS is. So you have, <clears throat> you have a single node which acts as an experiment controller. Um, the experiment controller has a number of different cognitive engines that it may be using throughout the experiment, um, different, different scenarios that it will be running through, um, and then a lot of, uh, you, you log all the data as the experiment takes place. Um, 
And then with, on the test bed, you'll have any, any number of cognitive radio nodes that may be, you know, you may have multiple networks of cognitive radios that are coexisting. Um, you may have interference sources or primary users that you need to avoid. Um, this is all kind of encapsulated in this framework. Um, yeah, we're, we're using uh, Liquid DSP. Probably a lot of you are familiar with it. It's a, a library that's written in C that implements a lot of signal processing. So we're, we're using that for the majority of our signal processing at this point. Um, and of course, we're using Cornet for this development. Um, yeah, so again, the key features, flexibility and scalability of the, the test scenarios. So what I mean by that is you can very quickly define a test involving as many radios as you want, and there's no additional kind of overhead on your part. Um, so you can enter a single command and launch a, a test involving, you know, if you wanted all 48 nodes on Cornet. Um, and there would be no, you know, you don't have to log into 48 nodes and, and uh, you know, start the test. Um, and all the, all the nodes, again, they start automatically and synchronously. Um, and we, we generate network traffic using a tool called Wrapper, which was developed by the Navy. Um, but it, it allows us to yeah, generate realistic network traffic and also uh, measure performance on the other side. I um, mean, yeah, we, we evaluate performance at uh, layer one, two, and three. Um, and uh, yeah, another, another key aspect is the, the ability to flexibly customize the cognitive engines that are, that are under test. This is a block diagram <coughs> of the uh, test pr process that runs on a cognitive radio node. It's, it's pretty simple, but um, basically it, the, the node will communicate with the controller to receive any parameters it needs that are relevant to the test. Um, it generates network traffic and receives network traffic. Um, and it, 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 uh, it uses a, a virtual network interface that we set up on the, uh, on the node. And then on the other side of this virtual network interface, we have a cognitive radio process, um, which interacts with a software-defined radio front end. Um, so yeah, in the, in the previous slide, like I said, we have a cognitive radio process. And um, the way it's set up now, that, that cognitive radio process can be whatever you want it to be. You can write your own process. So um, there's, this, there's this distinction between the cognitive radio test system, which basically sets up cognitive radio networks and, and tests them, um, but doesn't rely on a specific cognitive radio. Um, and then, but then separate from that and independent from that, um, we've also developed a particular cognitive radio that we developed with the intent of, again, maximizing its flexibility um, and therefore its, it's kind of applicability to some of the research questions we're trying to address. So this is the block diagram of, of that cognitive radio. We call it the extensible cognitive radio. Um, and the, yeah, so again, we, we uh, interact with the, the virtual network interface. We use liquid DSP um, to generate OFDM frames and, and receive OFDM frames over the air. And then we have a, a generic structure where we have um, a user-defined cognitive engine. So, so basically, in, in terms of the software, what it is is there's a class for, you know, cognitive engine, and then a user can define a subclass of that, which will implement his particular cognitive engine. Um, <clears throat> and then so what will happen is as the radio runs, we'll uh, pass metrics from liquid DSP to the cognitive engine, and the cognitive engine can perform whatever calculations, make any decisions it wants, um, and then it can then exert control over the radio. Um, and yeah, on the right-hand side, I listed some examples of, of metrics that are passed from liquid DSP and some, some parameters that you might want to control. Um, so, so we put together some, some limited uh, demo scenarios at this time. Most of the the work has been focused on the framework itself. Um, but yeah, we, basically we've been, you know, we, we, we implemented some basic cognitive engines that might adapt the modulation scheme that's used based on uh, the packet error rate or, or feedback over the air. Um, 
we can look at you know a, a network of multiple nodes that are all communicating with one another. Um, and finally, uh, dynamic spectrum access. Um, so I'm going to go a little into a little more detail about the dynamic spectrum access because um, that is one of the uh, more prominent goals, I guess, of this work. Um, so this is just a yeah a particular experiment that we ran uh, just to kind of illustrate you know the idea of, of how you would do this. Um, so yeah, so we have a the experiment controller again on the the right hand side, which sets up the scenario on all the other nodes. And then we have two primary users who are communicating with one another, um, and two secondary users. And um, so the the scenario is very it's very simple. Um, basically, we we have two. We're considering two channels, um, each one megahertz wide, right right next to each other, um, and so the primary user is actually just just moving back and forth between them, and then the secondary user is trying to fill the hole, um, and just, so it it just senses where the primary user is and, and transmits in the other channel. So it's a, it's a very simple scenario, but um, it illustrates the idea of what we're. Um, so I, I recorded a, a short video of, of me actually running this scenario. <clears throat> so, so first I'm going to launch the controller. So <clears throat> in this demo, first I, I actually run the experiment in a, in a manual mode so that you guys can see a little more of how you actually, uh, of what each node is doing. So the, so the nodes on the left, the, the terminals, are the uh, primary user nodes, and the ones on the right are the secondary user nodes. Um, yeah, I pull up the spectrum here. So what you'll see is in the upper left-hand corner, the, the primary user will, every couple of seconds, switch its operating frequency. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner, you can see uh, a secondary user switch its transmit frequency based on its sensing of the uh, primary user. And then in the lower right-hand corner, we're, we're printing out receive frame metrics. Um, so whether or not the frame was valid, uh, the error vector magnitude, received signal strength. It's probably, I don't know if you can actually read any of it. Um, I probably should have blown up the text a little more. Um, but at, at least you can probably see the, um, the spectrum there. They're hopping back and forth. So that if you notice, one of the carriers is, is at a higher power. That's the primary user. And the other one is uh, the secondary user. Um, so no, another thing that, that we've done is um, we automatically generate octave logs of, of everything that happens in, throughout the scenario. So after you run an experiment, you can just immediately go into octave and kind of import um, all the data on everything that happened throughout the entire experiment. And then you can look at various performance uh, metrics that you may be interested in. Um, so, so on the left-hand side, uh, yeah, you probably can't read the text, but um, I'm just running an Octave script that was auto-generated by CRTS, um, and then I'm running a separate script that will plot, um, in this case, the throughput of one of the primary user nodes. Um, and again, I'm just just doing this to illustrate, you know, how the how the system works overall. <clears throat> um, and then finally, so so I just showed you, you know, running it in the manual mode where I, I was actually logged into every single node, um, and I just did that just so you could see kind of what each node was doing. Um, but you can, as I mentioned earlier, you can run this same exact scenario with just a single command from the controller, and everything will happen the exact same way. Um, so I'm just showing that very briefly. Um, so I also included just some examples of uh, some of the metrics we've been looking at and some of the, the logs that you can look at to see how the experiment went. Um, so here we're, we're looking at the, the uh, as I said, so that we're, you know, they're going back and forth between these two channels. Um, and so here we just plotted the transmit frequency of the two radios as a function of time. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side, they, um, the, the cognitive radio was able to track pretty well uh, 
the primary user and, and avoid it. Um, whereas on the, the right-hand side, it, it made a lot of false detections, and it thought it detected uh, the primary user, but the primary user wasn't actually there, and it, it made a bad decision. Um, so that's you know, an example of something you can look at. Um, we can also look at the evacuation time and detection rate of the cognitive radio. So, you know, we we know when the primary user uh, from the logs, we know when the primary user entered the channel. So we can look at okay, how long did it take the secondary user to detect the primary user and then leave the channel? Um, and the detection rate is just in the sense that it, if you have a maximum period of time that you want to be able to detect the primary user, um, this is the probability that you'll detect the primary user within that given time. Um, and again, I, I showed in the video, you know, plotting throughput. This is, um, again, just plotting throughput without the secondary user. So you can see it's, it's basically a constant line, um, very minimal uh, deviation, which is what you'd like to see. Um, and then with the secondary user present, you can see there's a lot more variance <coughs> in the throughput, which is, of course, caused by the interference that the secondary user imposes on the primary user. <coughs> um, and then if we just look at the, the average throughput throughout the entire scenario, we can, we can look at things like, okay, what was the, what was the overall impact on the primary user? Um, I called it rho here, kind of arbitrary, but... Um, so in this case, it was, you know, the, the throughput of the primary user was 0.97 with the secondary user uh, compared to what it was without. Um, and then we can also look at the overall achieved throughput of the system, um, both primary and secondary users. And um, in this case, you know, I mean, it's a very simple scenario, so we basically doubled uh, the throughput. Um, <clears throat> so the things we're trying to look at with this, uh, we want to validate some, some of the metrics that have been proposed in literature and some of the ones that we've been looking at ourselves. Um, evaluate the repeatability of testing these cognitive radios. You know, for instance, in a, in a game theoretic approach, does it always converge to a, a good solution and how does it converge? Um, things like that. We need different cognitive engines, uh, spectrum sensing, yeah, different spectrum access schemes and, and test and evaluation methodologies. Um, yeah, we're, we're in the process of uh, putting together some tutorials. Um, I think this might be interesting for some of the uh, courses offered here at, at Tech, like the uh, Software Defined Radio course, probably the, possibly the um, Communications course. Um, and then finally, we're, we're hosting a student contest um, it's going to be similar to the DARPA Spectrum Challenge, but uh, using using CRTS. Um, I guess I don't think I have the date on here, huh? I think it's in November, December. Is that right? The first stage in November. And then we're, we're having one in the spring, too. Yeah. Um, we need to register by October 15th. For the first phase, yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I was the one that came up with the, the spectral shark fin there, but I can't take credit for that. Um, so yeah, if any of this is interesting to you, you can, you can look at the code on, on GitHub um, for the tutorials, and of course, uh, if you want to sign up for the, the contest, you're welcome to. So that will conclude my talk, sir, if there's any questions. Any questions? <laughs> I mean, you, you talked about this being integrated with the overall just the core network. Have you thought about trying to take the construct of what you're doing and make it usable within the LTE core net facility as well? So that maybe you could do real LTEs, some of the spectrum sharing examples you use, like you do with the JW3 or the LTE. Right. Um, well, so, so I guess my first comment is. Uh, it's not necessarily limited to just Cornet. I mean, we're using Cornet to develop it, but right. it's being developed in such a way that it should be usable on any so generic uh, test bed. But yeah, its its applicability to the LTE um, test bed is probably. I mean, 
at this point, I would say it wouldn't be um, interoperable because, um, I mean, there, you guys are mostly using closed source software. So, so there would be a lot of uh, integration effort, I think, right. okay. to do it's that. It's not impossible, but time no. and money, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. possible, but yeah. Right. It takes some effort. Um, so we're also developing um, educational material for undergrads to understand spectrum management, spectrum access, and communication. So one of the things we have developed for Cornet is called Cornet TV. Um, yeah, so like he's, I think like he said, uh, this was developed by Nikita originally like a year, year and a half ago. Um, but yeah, so this shows the, the test bed. Um, the nodes are color coded so you can see the status. Basically green means they're good to go. All of means um, the node is up but the USRP is uh, unreachable and red means the, the node is down. Um, so you can just click. Click on the node and, and the spectrum should come up. I guess this, this isn't the way because the, it doesn't have the. That's not the latest version that we yeah, have. It's, it's not the latest version. Um, if you go to uh, metagrid2.sv.edu slash projects, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> the first part remains the same. From uh, until EDU, it, it's the same. Okay. Uh, projects. Just get it. Okay. Somewhere else? From the corner section. Oh, from, oh okay. The same right. section. Okay, he selected one of them. Yeah, you can speak to help. I wasn't sure which one he selected. Okay. He can change the frequency and look at another one. Yeah, this oh, is okay. just the That's default. Fine. So it's, it's, this is what's going on at the end. This is what's yeah. going on at the same frequency. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? More, we've got plenty of time to ask a few more questions. No questions? Questions? If you want to ask any questions about any of the presentations, this is Eric's time, but. <laughs> So everybody knows exactly how all this is working. <laughs> There's a quiz right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.